Hello, and welcome to the last session of the day. My name is Jen Fern, and I am the Regional Rehab Coordinator with the Northeast Ontario Stroke Network. And it is my pleasure to introduce our final speaker, John Power. John is a physiotherapist who was born in Timmins, Ontario, but now lives and works in Perry Sound. He graduated with his Master's of Physiotherapy from the University of Saskatchewan in 2016. Since then, he has worked as a physiotherapist in the acute inpatient setting on inpatient rehab, and he currently works in outpatient physio, where, is, where he is part of the outpatient neural rehab program. In his spare time, John enjoys camping, sailing, and everything Georgian Bay has to offer. Welcome, John. Okay, thank you, Jen. I'm happy to be here today. So today we'll be discussing managing shoulder pain after stroke. And specifically, we'll review some positioning and protection of the shoulder after stroke and how that pertains to acute nursing care. My hopes are today that you can take some of the information here and apply it to your practice starting as early as tomorrow. So here are the objectives for today's talk. Uh, by the end of this session, you should have a pretty good understanding for each of these and how they relate to nursing. So I'll go through each. Number one, explain why the shoulder is at special risk of pain and subluxation after stroke to list terminology and commonly used clinical assessment tools. Three, explain how nurses can identify shoulder subluxation and communicate it to the team. Four, implement early interventions in order to reduce likelihood of pain and subluxation. Five, identify techniques for transfers and mobilization. And then finally six, uh, Liz resources to provide it in the Canadian stroke best practice recommendations with respect to stroke after pain. So throughout the presentation, I'll be referring to recommendations from the Canadian Stroke Best Practices. So that's at strokebestpractices.ca. Throughout the slideshow, you'll see some of these red hearts here I have on the bottom left. Uh, that just signifies that this is one of the recommendations taken off of this 5.1 section, managing the upper extremity following stroke. So we'll start off with a quick case study. It's 6 p.m. on a weekday. Uh, Mr. Jones, who's a 68-year-old gentleman, is your new admission, is a diagnosis of a left MCA stroke. So he'll have some right-sided hemiplegia. You receive a handover that he's assistive one for transfers and ambulation due to right-sided weakness and unsteadiness. Mr. Jones calls for assistance in order to get up to a chair for dinner. So what comes to mind when first assisting him up to the chair? And I'll just leave the case study at that for now. And we'll go over all the... Uh, presentation, we'll get back to this at the end. So jump back into the objectives. Uh, number one, explain why the shoulder is at special risk of pain post sub or special risk of pain and subluxation post stroke. A uh, good way to understand the shoulder is to contrast it to the hip joint. Both of these are ball and socket joints and this type of movement allows for movements through pretty much all planes. Uh, your hip is meant to move to get your foot somewhere, to move your body. It's a weight-bearing structure, so it's built solid with a deep socket that surrounds the head. Uh, your shoulder, on the other hand, its purpose is to move your hand somewhere to get your hand to do something. It's not a weight-bearing joint, so it really sacrifices that stability to enable for more mobility and flexibility. So if you'll get through these images on the left here, uh, these are just images taken from our skeleton in clinic. Uh, you can see the top left is the hip joint. It has that nice big acetabulum surrounding the bone, the shoulder joint, not so much. You can really see how it's quite unstable just by its very bony structure. So where does the joint get its stability? Uh, the first layer comes from that bone structure, as I already mentioned, not very stable. The second layer, that comes from the ligaments. And yet again, these are designed to sacrifice stability in order to gain some more mobility. So you can see that inferior part of the ligament capsule where that red arrow is pointing at the bottom, there's a lot of loose lists there, which allows for you to move your arm. Uh, it just so happens that that inferior part of the shoulder is where your shoulder will tend to dislocate. Last and most importantly are the layers of the muscles that hold that humeral head centered in the glutenite socket. And they always act, they are the main supports for that shoulder joint. Uh, of course, all these structures have age-related changes that may lead to them being compromised. So that's something to keep in mind always when working with older patient populations. Uh, so what exactly is subluxation in hemiplegia? Some, diff simple outline, or, uh, some simple definitions outlined here. Hemiplegia is just the loss of strength or motor control as a result of injury to the brain. And subluxation is the partial dislocation of the shoulder joint. So that ball of the humerus comes out of the glenoid socket. 
what causes a subluxation? Uh, during the initial period after a stroke, the hemiplegic arm loses that normal muscular support. The shoulder is thus supported by that weak inferior capsule and ligaments. Without that muscular support, the weight of the arm alone can just stretch that joint capsule and cause an inferior subluxation. This is why it is so prevalent. Additionally, there could be further damage or subluxation from the events surrounding the stroke itself. A common example would just be a patient having a fall onto that affected side. Here's a simple image demonstrating anatomy of that sublux shoulder. All we're looking at here is a glenohumeral joint with a supraspinatus muscle on top. That's one of those rotator cuff muscles, uh, which is crucial to protect the shoulder from the gravity of this arm. And so as you can see on the image on the left, that's your normal protected muscle. On the right, that muscle has lost its tone and allowed to be stretched, which allows gravity to pull the shoulder downward. And so why do we care about shoulder subluxation post-stroke? It ultimately will or, uh, has a high correlation to lead to hemiplegic shoulder pain. So we want to reduce or prevent this pain. Uh, this is commonly seen in 34 to 40, 34 to 84% of stroke patients. It develops typically early on post-stroke. Pain is typically begins uh, with high tone, and we'll talk about that further on. And it's associated with a slew of functional and pain-related activities, such as decreased upper extremity recovery, decreased ADLs, decreased quality of life, increased length of stay in rehab, increased depression, increased risk of complex regional pain syndrome. Next objective we're gonna look at are the terminology and commonly used clinical assessment tools. So we'll jump into some terminology. Uh, another common definition you'll see of subluxation is a uh, palpable, palpable gap between the inferior aspect of the acromion and the superior aspect of the, the humeral head. That's more than one figure breadth or one centimeter. The prevalence of a shoulder subluxation occurring after stroke is estimated at 17 to 64% of all stroke clients. This is in large part due to different methods used to assess the shoulder subluxation. And in the literature, researchers pretty much comment it's normally at that higher end, so probably around 60% of patients post-stroke. Uh, subluxation will also most commonly develop three weeks post-stroke. Uh, this is that time where patients have the lowest level of motor control or tone in their arms to support their joint. So that brings us to the next important term, which is tone. Uh, for tone, we commonly think of how firm or how tight a muscle can be, but a more precise and measurable definition uh, is listed here. That's the resistance felt by the examiner during the passive stretch of a joint when the muscles are at rest. At any given time, our nervous system is controlling the tone in any muscle. After an injury to the nervous system, such as a stroke, we'll end up with some altered tone. Uh, this tone exists on a continuum where you have normal tone in the middle. So if you take someone with no previous neurological injury, you'd expect no tone to that passive resistance. You should be able to move their arm throughout their whole range in a relaxed state. Hypertonia, you'll feel some resistance, catches of resistance, or some full rigidity. And at the lower end of that tone, or at the lower end of that continuum, is hypertonia or flaccidity, where there is absolutely no tone. Uh, so you won't feel it, but you also get the, say, the, uh, the side that there's an inability for the nervous system to, to produce tone, uh, which is there to protect the joint from passive movement. Uh, some more terms you'll commonly see is spasticity. Uh, this is a common word to describe involuntary muscle jerking and is often used as such. But for a more, again, precise medical term, it's a velocity dependent increase in tonic stretch reflex with exaggerated tension jerks. So for example, uh, when we test the speed at which a limb can be moved, there's usually a, a catch at a certain angle. So if you were to move your elbow quickly, you might have a catch here at that 90 degrees that you can then move on. Um, as you imagine, as a patient, it can be difficult to affect your, your voluntary movement because it's involuntary. So if you go to grab for a mug or something, you might not have the good planning because you'll have a catch. Uh, another common term you'll see is rigidity. This would be an example of a hypertonic disorder where the muscle resists movements at low speeds and does not return to a fixed posture. So a commonly seen example here is someone with rigidity in their grip, where it can be quite difficult for them to let go of something or even to just open their hand to grab something. 
And another common term, again, is synergies of movement. So these are stereotype patterns of movement that occur following stroke. These are involuntary movement patterns. They occur just to the altered level of tone post-stroke. Post uh, the patient just typically loses control of that voluntary movement and they're stuck in certain uh, positions. So here's an example of a flexor synergy of the upper limb. And on the left here, it's pretty classic. All of those movements are described here. On the right side here is a flexor synergy of the lower limb. We won't go over that today. Um, so how do we go about diagnosing a sublux shoulder? As mentioned older, earlier, we can feel for that gap between the acromion and the humerus. So we can actually do some quick landmarking on your own shoulder here for practice. If you start by practicing or uh, pressing against the head of your humerus on the outside of your shoulder, so palpate that lateral surface, you should feel a ball-shaped bone lying right under your deltoid. And once you have that, you can work way slowly up until you feel a small divot and then another bony bump. That bump is your acromion and the divot you passed over, that's the shoulder joint. So that's your joint line. On most people, this should just be a small divot and you can only get your fingertip in there. On a fully sublux shoulder, however, you end up something like this. So this is a pretty large subluxation. Uh, this is a full two finger gap, uh, but even more accurately, how we would measure this could be uh, marking a small line at one end of the acromion, top of the humerus, and measuring with a calipers or a tape measure uh, just to get some more precision. So in addition to that gap measurement, there's some more clinical assessment tools that you'll be seeing in practice. It's a good idea to just be aware these tools exist, what they describe, how this might relate to a patient's overall function, or better yet, how it relates to their risk of subluxation. So for strength, we use the five-point scale called manual muscle testing. It's just often abbreviated to MMT. At the bottom end of the scale, we just have zero to five, suggests no voluntary muscle strength, not even a twitch. Slightly more strength than that is a one out of five where you get a small weak contraction, only enough to move through partial range. Two out of five, they can move through full range, but just not against gravity. At three out of five, the muscle can move through full range, also against gravity. This is what we usually call anti-gravity strength. So if you can reach your shoulder, reach your hand right overhead, that's typically what we call anti-gravity strength, three to five. Four to five is move through that resistance, move through that range with some resistance. And five out of five is just full active range and what we'd expect for normal motion or strength. Range of motion is next, uh, often be measured in degrees or to a lesser extent percentage of available movement if degrees aren't available at the time. Normally we'll comment on a patient's flexion, that's the forward lift, abduction, out to the side, or external rotation. So your hand rotated outward from your elbow. Uh, when a patient has a good range, we'll also denote this is within normal limits or within functional limits. Uh, and that's just to say that we'd expect their shoulder to be in this state or probably related to their other shoulder. Uh, next one will be modified Ashworth scale. So this would be a scale to measure tone. Uh, and then which again is uh, that muscular resistance to a passive stretch when the patient is trying to stay relaxed. So at the lower end of this scale, zero would be normal tone or no tone. So no, resist no, no resistance to that passive stretch. As you climb up the scale, tone becomes more and more pronounced all the way up to level four on the Ashford scale, uh, which suggests the joint is essentially stuck in a period of rigid position of rigidity, could be flexion or extension, most likely French flexion. Next is the Shadok McMaster scale. This is another very commonly used tool. Uh, this tool is used to measure impairment and disability following stroke. Like the previous tools, the lowest end of the scale denotes the least amount of function. So stage one being flaccid paralysis. This is where you have a really high risk for subluxation. And at the other end scale, stage seven would denote normal function. So lower risk for subluxation as well as hemiplegic shoulder pain. Uh, there's actually a training workshop for the Shadok Master Scale offered through the Neo Stroke Network uh, starting on Saturday, March the 26th. And I believe Sue tells me the instructor is Pat Miller, who's sourced uh, text I've sourced multiple times throughout this presentation. 
So in addition to the motor recovery, there's a similar seven stage pain scale for the shoulder McMaster. At the lower end, stage one, we see just both chronic pain in the shoulder as well as other painful parts on that hemiplegic side. This can be inclusive or exclusive of having a sublux shoulder. So we just always gotta keep in mind that pain presentations are complex and not always related to one simple issue. Uh, whereas at the higher end of the scale, we see reduced levels of pain. If you look at that stage six, that's uh, no pain is there, but one prognostic indicator of pain is there, which of course could be a sublux shoulder and they may or may not have pain. So again, it's good to, good to have awareness of those tools. You likely won't be using those in your daily practice, but you'll be reading about them in the notes and they'll help you make some more informed decisions about your patient's care. So next up, we'll go over how nurses can identify shoulder subluxation and then communicate it to the team. So as far as team, communi team communication goes, just assume that any stroke patients will be at risk for subluxation following stroke. It is uh, just good safe practice. Uh, so what you'd want to do is when you first start your shift or receiving a new patient into your care, just identify them as a, a patient who's had a stroke and just know that they are, are at risk. Uh, if possible, call Allied Health for any immediate needs, such as equipment or advice. Nurses just happen to be always the first point of contact. You're there 24 hours a day. Uh, Allied Health kind of works these nice daytime hours, and we're pretty much only with the patients for about one hour a day. So when documenting, a uh, quick mention for each of these points below can be very useful for the rest of the team. By no means do you have to use those assessment tools like the Shadok McCaster or Ashworth scale mentioned earlier, uh, rather a, a simple comment addressing each one of these movements. So do they have active movement? Can they participate in basic ADLs? Did you observe any of those synergies or tone postures? And just something like a hanging arm. So all good to comment on. And of course, pain which is just part of uh, standard assessments. So a couple of statements commenting on this can be immensely helpful. Uh, just a quick example, uh, patient states four out of 10 shoulder pain, flexor tone observed at rest, but patient capable of feeding themselves with their affected side. So a lot to unpack in a small sentence there. It could be quite helpful. Um, as mentioned earlier, if you have the availability, call down to Allied Health for a quick update or give any concerns. This way, proper equipment can be put into place in a more timely fashion. Also helps with Allied Health to plan for the day. Uh, we also are pretty happy to know that these patients are gonna be looked after from the, their shoulder perspective. Um, so next, uh, we're gonna discuss implementing early interventions in order to reduce likelihood of pain or subluxation. So really what we wanna do is prevent that subluxation in the first place. So just remember that those first three weeks are the period of lowest muscular support. So they pretty much depend on support from external source for that humeral head to not drop down out of the glenoid socket. Uh, there's many ways to accomplish this, a variety of slings, cuffs, taping techniques, uh, various arm, chest, or arm rests and trays. So we'll get more into each of these ahead. And in order to prevent, we need good positioning. So ultimately we're just trying to keep that humeral head relatively centered in the glenoid socket. So if you sit up with your arms by your side, you're generally gonna have a good symmetrical appearance. Shoulders should be in about neutral rotation. So if you bend your arm, your forearm should come perpendicular to your body, not against your body. So what we're aiming to do is get into that neutral position where that elbow's facing forward. Uh, this helps prevent synergies. If a patient is more positioned out of their synergy, they're more likely to move out of it, which is better for motor recovery. It can also prevent contractures, contractures being that permanent shortening of a muscle, which can have serious functional limits in the long term. Uh, but you should also be aware you can overcorrect by elevating the shoulder too much. Uh, this could cause some impingement, so pushing that humeral head too close to the uh, acromion. The other thing we can do with positioning is elevate their hand. So this helps reduce edema in the upper extremity post-stroke, largely as a result of reduced use in that arm. So if you're not using it, you can't get blood through it. Uh, it's also important just to keep sure and keep that shoulder in the back of your head throughout the day. Just know how the patient is positioned and know what they're doing and that they are at risk if they lose that proper positioning and prevention. So arm trough here is an example. Uh, this would be something that can support your arm quite well. It slides over the armrest of a wheelchair. 
some of the pros of it is that the arm is supported and maintained in a nice neutral position. This again can prevent contractures, good positioning. Some of the drawbacks are that the arm may be stuck in one position for a prolonged period of time. Uh, another thing is wheelchairs are not always a perfect fit for the patient. They could be too high, too low, too far out to the side. And sometimes, pardon me, it doesn't allow for the patient to have good functional use of that arm. So their arm is usually quite restricted into that position. So something else you'll see is a lap tray, quite similar setup to an arm trough. However, it can serve a bit more functional purposes. So pros are that it provides support for the patient's arm. Uh, it allows for more movement, so they're not really constrained by that trough on either side of their forearm. And it can serve as a desk or a food tray or a little workstation where they can move their arm more meaningfully and have a better outcome. Uh, some of the drawbacks of a tray are that, of course, similar if the wheelchair is not properly fitted um, or if it's a full lap tray covering both sides. If uh, used poorly, it can act as an ill-intentioned restraint, which we don't want to do. So given the drawbacks for a lap tray, why not just attach the sling to the patient to give them support? So of course the drawbacks to that or the cons are that it holds that upper extremity in a synergistic pattern. So we don't want to encourage that synergy pattern. We want people to move outside of it. Uh, limits that functional use of the affected limb. So slings are one of those things that used to be a common part of practice, but however, they've, they've fallen out of favor in the past few years for better methods. Uh, what they should be used for is a temporary use for transfers to give support. And by using the sling temporarily, we're not getting those drawbacks of restricting function. It's just short-term protection while we knew it, do what needs to get done for the transfer. Uh, many types of slings and cuffs have been developed to suit varying presentations of function. So while they might not have a, a purpose, they have certain purposes and there's different types uh, that would probably be prescribed by Allied Health, OTPT. Uh, such as this arm cuff here, or the this give more sling, which gives you that support and allows you to actually move your arm in a more uh, neutral and normal movement pattern. Taping, this is something else you can see post-stroke, often performed by Allied Health who have experience or training in taping. It's often used to support the shoulder, enables a lot of freedom of movements for patients to participate in therapy or daily activities without restricting them from slings or other supports. Uh, functional electrical stimulation, or FES, is another common thing that you might see. Uh, electrodes are placed over your deltoid and rotator cuff muscles. Once you activate these muscles, it helps reduce the humeral head back into the socket. Some members of the Alley Health team may have training for this. And this is a, just a nice example, it shows how it reduces that humeral head back into the glenoid socket. So it can be hard to see on the screen. So I've traced out the humeral head in red glenoid socket on the yellow here. So on the left, that's just a natural hanging sublux shoulder. And on the right with FES applied, you can see how it comes up, reduces nicely. So early management will also include some range of motion exercises. Uh, patient will often have some of these to perform throughout the day. So if you're ever assisting with these, it's good to just keep these rules in mind. Handle gently. Uh, advised for nursing or the patient or family members. The, the patients themselves don't always know to be gentle and sometimes they're, they're not aware of that shoulder position or what they are doing. Um, another rule, stay below 90 degrees of flexion and abduction. Never force into painful ranges. Again, this is something that you may have to remind the patient as well if you happen to see them going through their exercises. And then lastly, not using pulleys. This of course has been out of favors for years. However, the questions often still come up, especially if anyone's ever gone through some other types of physiotherapy where shoulders were quite helpful. Uh, another point here to add is uh, just engaging the patient's hand. Um, anytime the hand's in use, it forces the upstream muscles, so forearm, biceps, shoulder, uh, to really turn on. And so the more you can get someone using their hand for activities, the, the better that shoulder outcome will be. Uh, education, another important aspect uh, for that early management. This goes for all healthcare workers, family members, and especially the patients. So we have to know to always be aware in the, of the appropriate assistance and the, the position that shoulder needs to be in. Uh, Allied Health, OTPT, will often be reviewing safe handling practices with family members. Uh, nurses can reinforce this information. OTPT can train uh, the patient to direct others 
Uh, so again, something nursing can reinforce of the, the good handling and maintaining those rules from that, that last slide. Uh, so again, just a bit of a review, some do's and don'ts. So avoid pulling on the shoulder. Instead, it's better to have the, or having the patients pull themselves up during transfers. Instead, what would be better is to encourage the patient to push from a solid surface, either their bed or their armrest of, their, of the chair. Uh, try not hooking your arm under their arm. If you have to, uh, it's much better to grip from a waistband or better yet, a transfer belt. So any patient that will need a transfer belt will have one. And then lastly, don't move their arm over 90 degrees. So just thinking of then put your hand above your shoulder this way or to the side. And this is really important to keep in mind when assisting with dressing. So number five, identify techniques for transfers and mobilization. Uh, we'll just start this off with a question. If you're walking with a patient who has a sublux shoulder and you feel they're about to fall, what's your best course of action? So just think about what you would do in normal circumstances with a, a friend walking down the street. The easiest and first thing to grab, it's usually their arm. Uh, it's accessible, grabbable thing. So what you wanna do is even before assisting in a transfer, you wanna set yourself up for success. So some basic guidelines would be to stand next to their affected side. It's the side a patient would be more likely to fall towards. In this way, you can have your body for support. Uh, you'd want to have a transfer belt on them so that you have good control. If that's not possible and it's just a backup, pants is always better. Uh, it's always better to grab someone's pants. So a wedgie is much, much better than something like a sublux shoulder, which can cause all kinds of problems down the road. Uh, so just avoid grabbing that arm for support. And it's good to keep in mind these patients will often have neglect of their affected side and they probably won't be aware of their arm position, so it's quite vulnerable. So we have to be aware of their shoulder for them. So some transfer and positioning tips. <clears throat> uh, it's good to just be aware of their arm, know their position at all times. A good thing to think of is if it looks wrong, it probably is. Uh, don't forget that they, again, will have that neglect of their hemiplegic side. We'll need to coach the patient, remind them of their shoulder, any, every little bit reinforces what they will be learning in therapy. And another thing is that arm should be supported against gravity all times when standing or sitting. And that's something else taken from stroke best practices. Uh, bed mobility. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go over each now. We'll go for some bed mobility, transfers in and out of bed and for walking. So in bed, so you still wanna support the shoulder with a pillow especially if you think the patients might be inclined in their bed, gravity will still be pulling down on that arm. So you're gonna to wanna to support it to prevent that subluxation. Uh, just for an easier transfer, it's always easiest to roll towards their stronger side. That way their unaffected arm will be able to do a lot of heavy lifting and be careful when rolling on their affected side. They are able to lie on that side. You just wanna ensure that patient's arm is in a good position as they might not be aware. So. It could be under their body or it could be way out to the side where they, they may not have that sensation of where their arm is. So again, we have to be aware of that arm for them. Uh, another thing is elevating the hand of the affected side will assist with edema management. Again, just if that arm's not being used over and over again, there's not that blood flow they would normally get. So transfers, getting in and out of bed, uh, basic, Transfer would be push from the armrest or the surface of the bed. So we, again, we just don't want to be pulling on that arm, nor do we want the patients pulling. So uh, if you're using equipment, ensure that arm is always supported. Any, any sit to stand aids at, here at the Westbury Sound Health Center, we use serostatis quite often. So we don't want their affected side to pull. Instead, we'd want them maybe in that temporary sling, or if you have a good reach in biomechanics to help the patient, you can support their arm. Uh, another example would be a mechanical lift. Always want to ensure proper position of the arm. Mechanical lifts don't come with nice arm rests, so we got to build something with a pillow or with a sling just to ensure that they're in a nice position. Transfers, walking. So we want to make sure that they have an appropriate gait aid, such as a walker, because likely they'll have some balance issues as well. Uh, the good thing about that is that it actively uses that arm. It gives the arm support. So we want to make sure it's appropriately sized. If you're standing with your arms by your sides, that handle of the walker height should be just about at the crease of your wrist. So this has that added benefit of supporting the arm and meeting their balance requirements. This brace you see here on the left, it's called a Givemore brace. 
uh, for patients with higher level walking needs and they don't really need a walker for balance, but they still have that high risk for shoulder subluxation, this is a good example for them. So this will likely be set up by Allied Health. Another good technique for handling, I, I like to use this two-handed approach all the time. So you'll use a, a handshake grip with one hand, or as you can see in the picture there, I have three fingers, just so the patient can really grab your finger well. Um, or if they have good enough control, they can do a full grip strength. So it just allows the patient to activate their arm, turn on those shoulder muscles for support, and then you'll support their elbow because that's ultimately, if you can control their elbow, you're controlling how much support that humerus is getting. So lastly, we'll go over some resources. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, strokebestpractices.ca, uh, it's an excellent resource uh, to review all these evidence-informed recommendations. Uh, it's simple to navigate and provides guidance for all professions. So if I just flip over to here, we started on these rehab and recovery falling stroke. And much of the information was taken off this 5.1 management of the extremity following stroke. And here's all the guidelines that you're going to be able to see. And the website is full of all kinds of different recommendations through different professions. So immensely helpful. Another example or another excellent resource of information, it's uh, available through the Neo Stroke Network. Here's a poster available by email. Uh, Sue really will be able to email you this. It's actually a great summary for all the information in this presentation. And we'll actually zoom in and uh, go over each of these points here. So uh, stroke topics, hemiplegic arm, a low tone hemiplegic arm is susceptible to injury. Vulnerable tissues may be stretched, torn or inflamed. These injuries directly impact potential functional recovery of the hemiplegic arm. Poor handling and poor position in the bed and wheelchair are key contributors to pain and potentially of subluxation of the hemiplegic shoulder. Pain can become chronic and difficult to treat. So it's good to do important this bottom point, subluxation is not correctable. So once you have that sublux shoulder, it is there. <clears throat> so prevention is the key. So during bathing and dressing, support the hemiplegic arm, move the joints slowly and gently, never pull, do not lift the entire weight of the arm by lifting only their hand. So that's that two-handed approach, get control of that elbow and then you have control of their arm. Never lift them through their armpit. You're just asking for an unprotected joint to support their body weight. <clears throat> uh, always transfer using a transfer belt and apply a sling correctly. Excuse me. <clears throat> so again, this is the full poster. Uh, available on neostroke.network.ca. Or, uh, sorry, on the Neostroke Network. <clears throat> so if we return to Mr. Jones, you're first meeting him without a previous assessment or set up from Allied Health. So I hope you take the information from today and you can apply it to this case. Uh, so right off the bat, you know that Mr. Jones has motor involvement from the stroke. Therefore, there's risk for subluxation. So before you transfer, you have a few options. One, you can get support from a second person, turn this assist of one to an assist two transfer just to protect that shoulder. If you have a sling aware, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a sling available to you, you can use temporary use of that sling to support a shoulder. And if a quick assessment shows he has decent functional use of that arm, you may be able to provide him with a walker to use. That will give him also the similar level support. Once he's in that seated position, you'll just want to watch that shoulder, use the tools that you have to give him the appropriate positioning and support ask yourself is it adequately supported and like what could you use to fix it and then lastly you'd want to educate mr jones about his shoulder and then give him as many cues or setups as possible write it on his whiteboard that his shoulder is at risk and that he should have it protected uh, so here's some of the references that i've referenced throughout the slideshow and if you wanted to contact me for any question after today's presentation here's some of my contact information uh, so thank you very much for your time Great, thank you, John. Thanks for that interesting talk. Um, it's it's great to hear about the shoulder and how we can, you know, do some things at the bedside that will help um, prevent future problems and future pain. It's it's 
quite an important part uh, for patients, for sure. So we're going to take a few minutes now for questions. So I'm asking people to please type your questions into the ask a question box, and then I can read them out to John. I also would like to remind you to click on the evaluation survey for this particular session, which again can be found on the right side of your screen. So to start, John, uh, what happens if you don't have the equipment you need at, uh, when you're working with your patient? Right, yeah, so you pretty much just have to, thanks for the question, to mm -hmm. um, kind of deal with what you have in front of you. So quite often, you don't always have those ideal pieces of equipment I had mentioned earlier. Um, so you think, what's the most available things? Usually what we have available is a lot of pillows for repositioning. So for example, the other day, I just had a, a patient who had a, a nail fitted wheelchair. Uh, so what we actually had to do was put two or three pillows under that arm to support it until that shoulder was in that good position. And we didn't have anything like a lap tree or anything. So they would have been kind of functionally stuck there. So we just brought their bed up really close beside them. And then we had them actually do some exercises. We had a few things that they could use their hand on the bed and start to do some therapy that way while their shoulders supported and it's in that good safe position. And therefore we weren't left kind of just scratching our heads it's because we didn't have equipment. We could actually use what little things we had lying around. So we're not always up using the most top high end stuff and essentially kind of just got to use what you have around you. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, that ability to get creative with what we have. Yeah, exactly. Um, now you mentioned earlier in your talk about uh, the Shadok McMaster scale and the co course coming to the Northeast, people were just wanting to get a little bit more information about that. Um, would you like me to just go ahead and talk about it? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Seeing as, you know, I'm putting on the course that maybe I could answer that for both of us. So the Shadok McMaster uh, st uh, Stroke Assessment course is going to be held on Saturday, March 26th. Um, it's an all-day event. Uh, you can register for it by going to the Stroke Network website. So www.neostrokenetwork.com. Look under education and you can find the course and the registration link for it. The course costs $100. Um, our speaker is going speaking from um, Toronto. And so she'll be on Zoom, but um, a requirement of the course is for our participants to be gathered together. So we have booked a room at our four main sites in Northeastern Ontario. So at Timmonson District Hospital, North Bay Regional Health Center, Health Sciences North, and Sioux Area Hospital, where people that sign up can gather to actually do the course and be certified in the Shadok McMaster scale. If you would uh, like to include your facility as one of the sites, you can uh, fire me off a quick email and ask me about that and I can see what I can manage. Um, of course, we're in a difficult time right now with the pandemic and we may have to postpone this course and we will take that into consideration a little bit closer, but just go onto our website and you can read all the information about um, when the course is and what it's all about. And um, hopefully we'll be, it'll be happening on March 26th. It's a great question. And then uh, another question, people are asking about how to get the hemiplegic arm poster that you showed on uh, one of your slides near the end there. Right. I Yeah, so I got that from the same uh, Neo Stroke Network website you just mentioned. So under the resources tab, uh, you'll be able to find a link for these posters. Uh, you have to email Sue. So hopefully, Sue, you're going to be available to answer those and uh, submit the uh, PDFs back. Um, but then they're great to print off and have available on the units because it's an immediate reminder. Uh, it's just in your face. So you get to have a quick review and you think about it immediately for those patients that you may be seeing that day. Yeah, right. Great. Yeah. So our administrative assistant will respond to those emails and send out the posters and then you can uh, print them off for your units. That would be great. Uh, so I think that's all the questions that we have today. Uh, once again, John, thanks for uh, a great talk and sharing your expertise. And I hope you're uh, staying warm in Perry Sound. And we appreciate um, your participation today. Thank you, Sue. Thanks.